This is the Lepac Area Public Library's Lunch and Learn. Now I'm going to introduce our speaker. Sue Abrahamson is the children's librarian here at the library. How many years have you been doing that? 21. 21 years. She's been here much longer than me and has really done a lot for our library. Is that because I'm still alive? Or is that... <laughs> what? Well, you're young. Oh, yeah, that's it. And she's going to share some information about coding, and I'll let her explain what that is. So. We moved the microphone. Can you guys hear me okay? All right. Um, this is like my favorite thing to talk about. So when Patsy asked me, I was like, oh yeah, I'm on it. And then I get to pick out all the toys. Okay, this is not working out. Hold on. Um, I actually go around the state and uh, talk about this because our library is considered one of the premier libraries that is bringing coding to uh, their patrons all around the state. So I've been way up as far north as almost Bayfield. I'm going down to um, New, New Berlin in January. I've been to uh, the southwestern part of the state. So it is a very um, hot topic in libraries and uh, it is, as you will find out, a necessary thing to know about. Um, I don't know if I'm really a code talker, not like the Navajo code talker. <laughs> But um, I do like to think of myself as being comfortable talking about code. Um, so this is what we're going to talk about today. Um, how did I get to be interested in coding and why was I asked to talk about it to you? And why do public libraries care about coding? Uh, what you should know about coding. Maybe some of you are just going to find out what coding is all about. And um, most importantly, how is coding connecting people worldwide? So uh, it might be a wild ride. If you have a seatbelt on your chair, <laughs> go ahead and use it. You never know. Um, I went to college in 1973, and my dad made this great purchase for me. I knew right then and there I was a technology gadget guru. <laughs> I thought my Texas Instrument uh, calculator was the most awesome thing. It was the size of a shoebox. <laughs> and you had to plug it into an AC adapter. Some of you are nodding. Maybe some of you had a Texas <laughs> instrument. I'm telling you, my dad was so afraid. This cost him over $100. Check out the functions on it. You see, you see, a, you see a percent sign on there anywhere? Or a square root? A square root, you know, or how do I figure out the interest on my whatever? No. Uh, my dad was so worried that someone would steal this technology from me that he etched my name with like one of those Dremel tools in the back, like that was going to stop anybody from stealing it from me. But I, I went to college well prepared, well prepared. And then I took a computer class. Yes, it was using punch cards, IBM punch cards. I see nods going on here too. My biggest fear was that I would drop the box that I had carefully placed in order and I would drop it on the way to class and fail the whole semester because I couldn't keep those darn cards in order. But the good news was at the end of the semester you could make this beautiful Christmas tree. You could spray paint it gold. I mean, I'm not going to ask you to show your hands if you ever had one of those in your house. Oh! See, some of these. I didn't mean to shout, sorry. Um, but this was the technology. And, and we thought that was the most awesome thing. But I have to tell you that my husband and I talk often that it wasn't that long ago when his dad was farming with horses. <laughs> we're one generation out from this. And so we're on this technology roller coaster, right? Yes. And we're thinking to ourselves, how am I ever gonna keep up? You know, I, I bought this really great um, transistor radio. <laughs> then I got my iPod. And I got this little small thing. Now my phone does it all. I can't keep up. And my husband's thinking, okay, how much more ga how many gadgets can we have? But you know, it, it is a it's a spiral that we have to be cognizant of that technology is changing. And they often say, as soon as you buy something, it's going to be out of date. And you probably have heard that. Well, it's the same way with cars. So my dad gave me this Pontiac Bonneville to drive. It was great. I could get 10 girlfriends in there. We could go bombing around town. We had a great time. But my dad always said, 
Make sure you check under the hood. Check the, check the oil. Check your windshield, right? Right. It's important to know. We could fit two more people under the hood <laughs> of that bonobo. But nowadays, the last car we bought, we never even looked under the hood. What would we look at? <laughs> that, that's what it would look like. And I'd be like, uh, I don't know. You know, really. And that is because, check this out. Every car, every car, even the lowest car on the price list, it's going to have between 35 and 150 computerized mm. functions in it. Some for your safety, some for um, some for uh, I'm totally not following any of my notes. Uh, some for our comfort, and some for the car's performance. And um, even with all these technologies, they still can't figure out why my check tire light won't go out. <laughs> and maybe you're nodding about that too, right? So we have these frustrations, right? And maybe we're frustrated because we don't understand. Maybe, maybe that's the thing. So our goal today is to understand that technology is in everything. Everything you touch. If it has an on and off switch, it has electronics and technology in it. Um, it also affects every field of commerce. And in healthcare, I will tell you, I am the proud owner of a brand new robotically installed, this is the Mako robot that put my knee in two months ago. And I'm doing amazing. I, I couldn't believe how fast the recovery was. Um, this little contact here is actually designed to uh, detect levels of insulin in people with diabetes. All of these things were developed using computer technology. So it, it isn't just Disney animation, it isn't just um, the cars we drive, it's in our homes, our thermostats. You know, I can remember we turned that dial. We were somewhere around 65, I don't know. Now it's 72, 70 on the dot. You know, those are all computers in our homes. So we can't go backwards. We really, really can't. We love the luxury and the convenience computers offer us. And um, most likely we are not going to go back. We we're not going to go back to the typewriter. We're not going to go back to the horses. Uh, we're we're going to forge ahead. And those of us who are upset about it can be upset about it, but the world will pass us by. <laughs> Just saying. So we need to talk about what is coding. Um, and this is a huge concept. What you need to understand, first of all, is that public libraries in Wisconsin are under the Department of Public Instruction's uh, umbrella in the state government. So the Department of Public Instruction uh, helps public libraries develop new technologies, new literacies, new information, and roll it out to our public. And so a lot of this information I'm going to be giving to you is information I've gotten from the Department of Public Instruction. And this next video was created by them as a way of explaining to people why all of a sudden libraries are interested in coding. So let's, oh I forgot to introduce Molly. This is my friend Molly and uh, in case my computer doesn't work she is my clicker <laughs> and she's going to help us if the sound gets a little crazy. So thank you Molly. So I think you just click somewhere on the, uh, on the pad and it'll start the movie. Tap on it. Or not. See don't you love technology? <laughs> yes. Tapping on it doesn't hurt. Yeah. Yeah. People are showing up to this coding education event offered by their town's library. Sophia really likes chess and logic puzzles, and her dad wants her to look into some careers. Coding sounds promising. Brian wants to support his family and decided he needs a new career he can learn quickly. Here's some friends who formed a bond this year. They all really need a creative outlet. Building an amazing website would be a great way to make their mark in the world. Plus, knowing how to make things online is a powerful skill. So this free event is right up their alley. Sharon and Kiara don't know anything about coding, but they're used to collaborating. And if she likes it, Kiara's planning to organize a similar event for employees at her business. Sharon might do the same with the after-school group she runs. Watching everyone arrive, Tua is amazed. He set up this event, but even he didn't realize how many different roads could lead to coding these days. 
He hasn't told anyone about his own interest in coding. More about that later. But to be honest, he wasn't really sure what coding was until recently. It can be confusing. To some, coding is a synonym for computer programming. Other people say it's more or less than that. But for the library's purposes, they went with the understanding promoted by the Coding Initiative in Wisconsin Public Libraries. When we say coding, we're thinking about computer programming, but also a kind of literacy. The ability to apply a certain type of thinking, often called computational thinking, for problem solving and stimulating creativity. Defined like this, coding includes many ways of solving problems, designing systems, and even understanding human behavior. It really is a huge field for anyone and everyone. Tua used resources from the state initiative to set up tonight's event as a way for people in the community to come together and get better at this modern language. The evening will feature some games that aren't on computers to work on the mental skills behind writing code. There will be some computer activities that are also pretty visual. And for those who want to, there will be the chance to go all out typing code. So too has happened, mostly for his community. But also, he thinks maybe someday he could build an app to help manage some of his library projects. It might take a little time, but that's why, just like for everyone else here tonight, it's important for him to get a taste of this thing that's become so ubiquitous. Your library can help many people in your community with many different needs by offering some kind of coding education. Learn more about how to do it at our website. There you go, you tax dollars at work. I'm telling you though, the simple thing is it's just breaking down the problem into smaller steps. My dear friend Barb Hayes is a coder, computer coder for the Wapaka Foundry. And when we go together and we talk to kids at school, she explains it as this way. She goes, let's say our project, our problem is that the cookie jar is empty. Now well, I kind of like that kind of problem because I know how to fix that problem. And she says, but we need to make some cookies. So let's write down the steps. And she goes right to the board and she breaks it down. Well, then they say, well, you, you make the cookies. You make the dough. Well, how do we do that? And she takes it all the way back to buying the ingredients at the store. And that's that computational thinking that they were talking about in the, in the video clip here, is that you, you break down the problem into smaller steps. Uh, another great example is if you uh, <coughs> sew with a pattern, if you are a knitter or a crocheter and you are following a pattern. Uh, it's the language the needles know, right? It's, it's what makes the sweater turn out right. And you know what happens when you make a mistake? The dart ends up in the wrong spot or something happens. And what do you have to do? Start over. And that's exactly what computer programmers do. If they make a mistake, they go back to the drawing board. And what a great lesson for everybody to learn perseverance, that things don't always happen the first time you try. I think that's a marvelous lesson. Uh, just a couple days ago, I was listening to my granddaughter and my husband play checkers. And I thought about checkers as being one of those computational things. It has those variables. If I move my checker here, then he can jump me here and then, but I will use that, lose that one guy and I can move. So that computational thinking two or three steps ahead, thinking if I do this, then that will happen. That's the kind of language we're talking about. So. Um, before I go any deeper into, pro into coding, I don't want you guys to think of it as really hard because it really, really isn't. When we talk about it with kids at school, um, it's very, very simple. And it gives them the uh, ability to become digital, uh, digital creators. Uh, the first computer was in 19, built in 1943, but the first computer program was built by Ada Lovelace, who was Lord Byron's daughter. Uh, and there's some biographies of her over on the table. Any of those books, by the way, are, and movies are available for checkout. Um, was built in 1843. So the idea that, that this programming, that and causing a machine to do something by giving it intricate direction in a language that the computer will, <coughs> that the machine will understand, is not a very new technology. It's just that the computers are, that understand that language are um, developing fast, 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 fast. 
So how many of you see kids like this? <laughs> right? That's what makes us angry about computers. At the Thanksgiving table, you know, the grandson comes and he's like this, and you're trying to talk to him about his day, and he's like this. Um, this is how we see a lot of digital users, and I have to admit, once in a while, I am one of those too. You know, if I'm playing a little game on my phone, or if I'm checking my Facebook page to find out what, you know, somebody had for lunch, I don't get it. But they post that stuff. Uh, I could very well look like that, right? Um, our goal in promoting coding at the library and in schools and to kids and adults and everybody is to move people from digital users to digital creators. And digital creating is um, something I think if I was to ask you to close your eyes and imagine the workspace of a computer programmer, you might make a mental picture that I would have had a couple years ago. I pictured a white male maybe a pocket protector in his <laughs> shirt, glasses, sitting in a darkened cubicle, staring at a computer screen. And that's, in my mind, how I envisioned someone who was a computer programmer. And if you do that, and if you're thinking that way like me, you are most likely as wrong as I was. Because computer programming is a very social, interactive, process and we're going to learn that in just a few minutes so as we go along you'll see more and more there's lots of give and take there's lots of teamwork I'll maybe have four or five people on my team to solve this problem we'll all come with different solutions we'll have to work together to try which one's going to be the best solution we're going to coach each other we're going to offer um, advice how we can make things better it's pretty amazing it's what employers in the 21st century are looking for Here's the truth. 90% of parents want their kids to study computer science, but only 40% of schools nationwide teach it. In Europe and other continents, computer science is mandatory. Everybody takes it, everybody learns it. Not necessarily everybody works in that industry, but they all have knowledge of it. We are in a play catch up game. Huge, huge, huge. Now Wisconsin is great. I mean, we're, we're moving up, we're much ahead of other states. We are one of 35 states who allow students to take computer science toward high school graduation. Some states don't. Um, we also have a set of standards for computer science, K through 12, and a lot of states don't do that. But where we have fallen short is that we do not require all high schools to teach computer science. Iola does not teach computer science. When I asked the gentleman who teaches math if he was qualified to teach computer science, he says, oh, yes. He's a nice man, and I'm not picking on Iola, but this is an example. He says, but nobody has asked for that class. I can't imagine in this day and age that someone would not be interested in learning computers because of it. it's all around us. The state does not <coughs> also designate funds in the budget for computer science as professional development. So we've got a little ways to go in trying to boost our, our rating. And I think this is tied to our economic development. If we want jobs to come to Wisconsin, we want companies to come to Wisconsin, the jobs are almost all in this technical field. It's huge. But no one's going to come here if our workforce isn't trained in the right things. So we're working really, really hard. Um, right currently, according to the DPI, there are 73 100 or so open computer jobs. There are 918 computer science graduates and 60 high schools that teach advanced placement computer science. So you see the gap. It's really very, very sad. Oh, good. Now I'm going to be. It's not going to. Yeah. I do. Hold on. Sorry. Hooked up. It's just for the video, not for the room. So if it would take my blood pressure, too, it would be all right. <laughs> I'm waiting for my phone to do that. You know, it does everything else. It's my calculator, it's my camera. Now it could be my blood pressure cuff. I got it. I'm weighted down. All right, thank you. You might have heard about the 1% rule of the internet culture. Now this was a shock to me. So, how many of you have been on the internet? Okay, that's like a dumb question. Get this of the people create 
things for the internet. One percent. A few more are contributors. That means I can respond to my friend's Facebook posts, oh, your lunch looks good. <laughs> um, but the rest of us are lurkers. So what does this mean to our, our news? What does it mean to the way we make decisions? A very small percentage of people are influencing a large number of people. We need to make more creators. We really need to find people to be creators and move off that lurker stage into contributors and into creators. All right, this is my very fun favorite part. How can we help solve world problems? This is where I might put my storyteller hat on because these stories are what sell computer programming to people. I don't care where I've talked, to kids, to adults, to lioness clubs, to whoever, the stories I tell about computer programs are what sells the, the story. So here we go. I give you all the facts. Code for America is an organization very similar to like the Peace Corps. Okay. They're geeks on a mission. And they are sent to government agencies. They could be cities, they could be states, they could be uh, federal organizations who need some help. And these college kids, just like the Peace Corps, sign up to go to these cities in brigades. And these brigades help with problems. And the first problem I heard them talk about was in Boston. We know that when Boston gets a snowstorm, it's always bigger than anybody else's <laughs> snowstorm, right? They get like 27, 30 inches in two days. Um, prior to 2011, it was the job of the fire department, fire, firemen, to go out and shovel out every one of the 3,000 plus fire hydrants in the city. All in the same time, they were having an increase in calls for emergency response. This was a huge problem for the city of Boston. So the um, Code for America went in and they wrote an app and they asked people to um, adopt a hydrant in their neighborhood. They could name it. Big deal. <laughs> you can name it, but kid, people loved it. I can name my hydrant, you know? How awesome is that? Um, they created a map showing where all the hydrants are and who was responsible for what hydrant. And they would send out, they would ping people when they thought that it was time to go out and shovel that hydrant so you didn't forget that you had volunteered to. It cost the city nothing. But freed up the time of the firemen who aren't shoveling out, well, not all the hydrants have been, have been adopted. But what a great example. So this was such a great example that other places took, it, you know, took advantage of it. And in Honolulu, they have adopted a tsunami siren. <laughs> How amazing is that? So it's a win, win, win for everybody. And speaking of tsunamis, oh, I'll tell you, remember this one, 2011? And we saw that wave come over, and we just can't imagine, us flatlanders or Midwestern people, the, the devastation of a tsunami hitting your country. Unbelievable. I, I mean, I was glued to the screen. I couldn't imagine the force of that water. Um, right after this happened, Japan put together a group of teens to make teams and develop apps for, to help people with tsunami preparation. In two days, in a workshop that lasted two days, these teams put together 23 applications for their phones. And let's face it, Japan has a phone in almost everybody's hand, just like we do. Uh, that helps them uh, prepare their children, that helps them uh, know where the medical help, how to help somebody else if, if, they're, um, if they're disabled. So these teens in two days put together 23 different apps that will help their community be better prepared for a tsunami. I mean, it's not going to stop the water, but it's a great way to uh, put your heads together and think of something better. All right, there's well, don't, don't click it yet. Um, there is a movie we're going to show now. We might not need that, we'll see. Yeah. Um, there's a, a, lots of competitions with teens and, and young people, college kids. This one is called Techno, Technovation Challenge. 
and it's, it's geared specifically to girls because they are noticing that that this is still primarily a male field and uh, they're trying to encourage uh, people of color also to, to um, enter into the field. But Technovation Challenge meets every year and they uh, get girls from around the world to put together um, apps that will help their communities and the top prize is $10,000. And they have made a video and I have two copies over there ready to check out if you want to watch more if, you, if you're interested in this. So let's watch the trailer for Code Girl. Curiosity taking a selfie of itself up on Mars. <laughs> and look, it didn't even get his arm in. I, when I take a selfie, my arm is somehow in that picture. Um, interestingly enough, we have a rocket scientist that lives in our community. If you know Robert Bonata, he, is, he and his wife own the. Um, B &B and the yeah, the bed and breakfast and the Crystal River bed and breakfast. And he used to work at the Jet Propulsion Lab and tells me all these great stories about how he was coding and, and these rovers. Uh, it, it was in 2004 that they sent the first two rovers uh, to Mars. There was the uh, Spirit and the Opportunity, and they expected them to run just for a couple months. They ran for years. There's a wonderful PBS special about it, I don't know if you've seen it. They actually ha ran out of aluminum, so they had to go to the grocery store and they bought Reynolds, Re Reynolds wrap, and they made part of the rovers was Reynolds wrap, you know, and it went to Mars and it lasted for years and years and years. And so now, 2011, they, or 2012, they put Curiosity on the surface and they're still, it's still sending important data back to NASA. Everything this computer does, everything this rover does is computer generated. And the time it takes, they'll make a change, they'll say, oh, we don't want the rover to do that. So the coders will make a little change and then they have to wait hours for that message to get uh, to Mars, yeah. you know, but how amazing, think of that. I just, I'm fascinated by this kind of stuff. We have a book over there about beauty. Beauty was an um, American bald eagle, or is an American bald eagle, from Alaska that was sitting in a tree one day and was shot in the face. And its beak was broken off and a police officer found <laughs> beauty at the dump trying to feed itself, but without the beak to be able to tear apart the food and pick it up. Um, beauty was in big trouble. So the police officer brought Beauty to the uh, Wildlife Rehabilitation Center nearby and uh, they went to the local dentist and they had impressions made. <laughs> We've all had impressions made when we go to the dentist. And they used uh, 3D printer technology and they made Beauty a new beak. Pretty amazing. Now what they didn't realize is that the beak is growing. So every now and then, they have to take Beauty in and give her a, <laughs> give her a new overhaul. 
Uh, she'll never go back into the wild, but at least she can function on her own. But what a great use of 3D printing technology, right? Um, this summer, our teens at the library, you maybe saw this in the newspaper, um, participated in a program where they used our 3D printer, which is back there on the cart. It's a little black box. And they made these pieces, and I'll pass this around. The pieces take about a day to make. The filament is made out of plastic, but very it's biodegradable. Um, and it will, um, it's really strong. And then, of course, the teens use the hardware and the Velcro to put it all together. These were sent directly to young people around the world who have maybe lost an arm, leg, or an arm, or a hand. Uh, maybe in a mine accident or maybe in a, a birth, a birth defect situation, but we'll pass that around. What an opportunity for young people to, to make change around the world. Um, one of the things we do when we t take out technology here at the library, and, and we had our 3D printer sitting at the children's desk, and it was making all sorts of plastic trinket toys. And I got really sick of that fast. I was like, we're making a lot of junk. And so we said, let's try finding ways, show kids where it's being used in big technology, in, in real life situations. In Europe, they use this 3D technology to build foot bridges over canals. So it's, it's the same technology, except that the machine is coded to do this, and it's using, of course, metal, but not plastic. And in China, they use cement in their um, 3D printers and they can print these houses and these houses are built to withstand an 8.0 earthquake so in China that's huge you know every time there's an earthquake in China thousands and thousands and thousands of people are left homeless so they're using this technology one to quickly build houses um, and to make it a little safer in, in earthquakes so you can see from just the examples I've listed, how important technology is, and how we can move from that, I'm playing this game, you know, I'm in this zone, to moving kids toward being more creative with it. And our last video today, before I take you on a little shopping tour, um, is technology giants in the world telling us why coding is important and why kids should learn it. Um, but be, I know some of you said you had to leave early. I do have, where's the list of? On the table. There's a list of all of our toys. I know Christmas is coming and many of you have grandchildren and you might be thinking, uh, I want this coding thing to go. I want my children to know or my grandkids to know about coding. Now all of our toys are listed on that sheet. Approximate cost of what, what you can buy it for, where you might be able to find it. Um, if you want to come and try any of these, you can certainly stay afterwards and try these toys. Uh, we're having an hour of code in the first week in December, so you can come back and play with all of these things. These are these belong to you as taxpayers of Wolpapa Public Library. So um, you're welcome at any time. In fact, kids can come to the library at any time and say, I'd like to play with that, and we get it out for them. Uh, what happens in school is they, um, they learn about using some of these tools in school, but because there's 800 kids and one teacher, it's pretty hard to get the one-on-one -on -one time so they can come to the library and experience it here. So let's start this movie. This is my favorite movie of all. <coughs> Freshman year, first semester, um, intro to computer science. I wrote a program that played tic-tac-toe. I think it was pretty humble beginnings. I think the first program I wrote asked uh, things like, what's your favorite color? Or how old are you? I first learned how to make a green circle and a red square appear on the screen. The first time I actually had something come up and say, hello world. And it, I made a computer do that. It was just astonishing. Learning a program didn't start off as wanting to learn all of computer science or um, or trying to master this discipline or anything like that. It just started off because I wanted to do this one simple thing. I wanted to make something that was fun for myself and, and my sisters. And I wrote this little program and then basically just add a little bit to it. And then when I needed to learn something new, I looked it up, either in a book or on the internet, and then added a little bit to it. It's really not unlike kind of playing an instrument or something or, 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 you know, or playing a sport. Uh, 
it starts out being very intimidating, but you kind of get the hang of it over time. Coding is something that can be learned, and um, I know it can be intimidating. A lot of things are intimidating, but uh, you know what is it? A lot of the coding people do is actually fairly simple. Um, it's it's more about the process of breaking down problems than uh, you know sort of coming up with complicated algorithms as people traditionally think about it. You don't have to be a genius to know how to code. You need to be determined. Addition, subtraction, uh, that, that's about it. You should probably know your multiplication tables. <laughs> you don't have to be a genius to code. Do you have to be a genius to read? Even if you want to become a race car driver or play baseball um, or, uh, you know, build a house. And it, all of these things have been turned upside down by software. What it is is, you know, computers are, are everywhere. You want to work in agriculture? Do you want to work in entertainment? Do you want to work in manufacturing? It's, it's just all over. <laughs> Here we are, 2013. We all depend on technology to communicate, to bank, information, and none of us know how to read and write code. When I was at school, I was in this after school group called the Whiskers, and when people found out, they laughed at me and you know, all these things. And I'm like, man, I don't care. I think it's cool, and you know, I'm learning a lot, and some of my friends have jobs. <laughs> Our policy is literally to hire as many talented engineers as we can find. The whole limit in the system is just that there just aren't enough people who are trained and have these skills today. To get the very best people, we try to make the office as awesome as possible. trying to make a lot of money or whether you just want to change the world, computer programming is an incredibly empowering skill to learn. I think if someone had told me that software is really about humanity, that it's really about helping people by using computer technology, it would have changed my outlook a lot earlier. To be able to actually come up with an idea and then see it in your hands and then be able to press a button and have it be in millions of people's hands. Uh, I mean, I, I think we're the first generation in the world that's really ever had that kind of experience. Just to think that I mean, you can start something in, in your college dorm room and you can have a set of people who haven't built a big company before come together and build something that a billion people use as part of their daily lives is, is just crazy to think about, right? It's really, it's humbling and it's amazing. The programmers of tomorrow are the wizards of the future. You know, you're gonna look like you have magic powers compared to everybody else. It's amazing, it's, I think it's the closest thing we have to a superpower. Great coders are today's rock stars. That's it. The idea that we need to turn our digital users into digital creators is what we're all about. So what we've done now is we've set up around the room a bunch of toys, tech toys that are all involving coding that uh, if you want to uh, see them working, Molly and I are ready to show you how it works. Um, some toys start at uh, 35 $40, some go up to $150. Uh, they all are educational toys and we know the youngest children learn by play, and so that's why we 
about that. Some are non-tech, some are just board games. And some board games are for as young as four years old. Um, we have a, a, a coding iPad that we have preschoolers and grandmas sitting together and coding together and having a terrific time. Uh, there's a little Fisher-Price coded pillar that uh, Fisher-Price has been in the toy market for, well, must be a long time because I remember Fisher Price and I'm old. So, um, so they really have jumped on the coding cat, Coda Pillar. In fact, I think that's Peg's favorite, Coda Pillar. She loves the Coda Pillar. She, her kids might even get Coda Pillars. They don't have kids, but that's fine. And by the way, I'm so glad Peg was here because now she sees how I want my workplace to look like. Right on that. And Molly already told me that if Google comes to Wisconsin, she might have to jump ship and go work for them. So we may have a whole nother problem to solve. But that's an option. You know, if we have a workforce trained and ready to go, companies like Google, because these aren't just jobs in California. These are jobs everywhere. I want to thank you for your attention. I don't know how we want to do the. It's quarter two, and I know that's usually when you wrap up. Patsy, is there? You, would you like me to individually go around and talk about each toy, or how do you want to just? I do you want to do this. I think a little bit about each toy would be really great. All right, let's do uh, that. People quickly. probably don't know where to go and what to look at without it. All right, so. so um, yeah. Quick question. Yes. What, what did? Uh, Ada Lovelace have in mind, and what was behind her 1843 coding? She uh, worked on a computing, a computing machine, and so she wrote a program for a, a, a set of gears. Let me see if I can find a picture of it in her book. Um, and she worked with a gentleman who goes un, unrecognized, to tell you the truth. And um, it, it, it was a computer, like a, a modern, it was a modern day Texas Instruments. Yeah. It looked like this. Numbered gears in a section of Babbage's difference engine. So it was it was like a modern calculator. Amazing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. 1843. Yeah. But think about that. We were right on the edge of the Industrial Revolution. They were still weaving, making tapestries by hand. And and just think about how someone who could um, me mechanize a loom could make fabric that much faster. That's her thing. I'd like to recommend a book that I think I got in this library. It's called Power Play, and it's how video games can change the world. And I think it's kind of, you know, you have to code in order to make a video game. Yeah. It's about um, video games for kids in Israel to learn how to get along with Palestinians. It's oh. about, oh, yeah. was, it's about um, games for kids with cancer, and they're like, Chomping on the cancer cells as they're playing the game, and yeah. it helps them take their medicine. It's it's yeah. not very big, but it has one of the examples. One of the girls' good. teams in the code code girl movie, uh, they were from uh, Mexico, and the family violence was so huge, and the girls recognized this, is, and it, it is so imper imperviated through their culture that they made a video game for girls to recognize abuse because girls just took it as that's normal. Mm -hmm. this, this abuse is normal, and the girls are saying, no, this isn't normal. You know, we need to stop this family abuse, family violence. So, yeah, using the game to teach as a teaching tool rather than a time sucker, I'm all over that. All right, we're going to walk around. So, uh, yeah, now, oh, Carol. Just one question with when you were talking before about the job openings and how many kids can do them. What are kids getting out of college with that they're not qualified for those? Because well, you talk about to, kids with that and they end up at Hardee's. What's going on? Well, they, we, one, they'd have to relocate to a place that had, had those jobs. So the, the idea is bringing the businesses that need these jobs. So it's like I, I, I know of very few people who have computer science degrees that go un, okay. unhired. So that's the ticket. I know of very, very, very few. But having those skills and it starts with the very young learning that multi, uh, computational thinking if I do this then this will happen I want this machine I, I'm going to give a set of directions to this robot and this ro and I can make that robot do what I want it to do and we play a game called uh, capture the kingdom and and we set a, a deck of cards on the floor and the, the kids can land on a card and that's the card they get and if the computer doesn't go if the robot doesn't go there we go whoops Try again, because that's exactly what it's all about. 
right? We don't want kids to go, oh, I quit. It didn't work the first time. And I will tell you, from my granddaughter, I hear that sometimes and I just cringe because that's not perseverance. That's not, <laughs> stick, stick with it. Where's, you know, where's your grit? And that's what we're teaching. We're teaching grit and perseverance. I don't know, I'm getting on a soapbox. I should stop. Okay. I should just stop. Learning but really, learning. I don't want to quit because it's hard the first time. When you want anybody who, who you hire in a business to quit because something didn't work the first time they tried it? Uh-uh, not me. So can I address yes. Carol's question? I was just going to say that, you know, those biologists and, and um, people who go into botany, all of those things are really important, but they also need to have these computer skills. So if they don't have any computer skills and they only have biology, they need to get all of that to be able to work in today's society. Um, so it's not that we only want them to study computers. We want them to be able to use computer yep. language in order to work in the field where they choose. Yep. I want my surgeon to know how that robot works exactly. before he cuts me open. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Forty yeah. minutes later, the computer you works. You got somebody so with good. a question. I have a question. I read that um, I don't know where I read it, but that our libraries may be losing funding. The public libraries may be losing funding. Is that something true? It's always something true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right now, the state's the, uh, formula for funding libraries is still tied to the number of items checked out. And we all know that uh, uh, when Amazon can come to your door very quick and cheap, uh, and you don't have to wait for an item, that's a threat. We also know ebooks uh, can be purchased from other places. You can also get them from the library, and we're pushing that. But an ebook circulated from the library does not count toward our, our funding. Um, so until until the political powers that be recognize that libraries are more than just checking things out, we're about programs, we're about offering support like this, there will always be a threat. I think, um, I feel very comfortable in the 21 years I've been here that WAPACA values literacy, all literacies, not just uh, word on paper literacies. You know, we talk about Financial literacy, when it's Money Smart Week, we do money programs. Uh, when we talk about digital literacy like this, I, I think our community values that. I think we're a very strong literate community and, and one that supports its library very well. Um, we have a wonderful Friends of the Library group that has purchased ma the majority of these things and a foundation that does the same. Um, but you're right, I think, and Peggy might speak to it, I think it's, it's always a threat. Funding, funding for public services will always be a threat, always. Well, and, and to say, well, libraries might be cut, well, public works departments might be cut, police officers might be cut. There is a, a, a shortage of revenue that allows us to do as government the things that we need to do. And until that revenue stream becomes more constant and continues to grow, we will always be under that threat. I, I'll, I, I could talk about that for a real long time. Maybe she'll talk about that from the back of her Harley next time. Uh, <laughs> that's purely for fun. <laughs> for fun. For fun. Any other questions? I mean, I, I don't want to be a dire, you know, well, well it's me, but I'm, I'm also got the rose colored glasses on because I'm going forward. I'm not going backward. I just have to add that I have always said, you know, it frustrates me. People don't like government, they don't want government, they don't like taxes. But frankly, when you consider what government does for you, for you, even on just the local level, it's a crime that, the, that all we want to do is cut taxes. You know, we, we, we need all these services and I'll be quiet. Well, it's the quality of life. It's, cool. it, it's what you want. What, what, what are you willing to pay for what quality of life do you want? My, my daughter's, uh, one daughter lives in Iowa and they love their dirt roads. I could care less if I don't, I never want to live on a dirt road. I mean, I love my the fact that they come and plow my street. Sure. I don't have to worry about you know yes. the dust and heaven. You know, so it's a, everything's a trade off. Everything's a trade off. Everything's so. Let's just I walk around a little bit. This first game is uh, for five and up. It's called Code and Grow Go Robot. Um, there, there's a little challenge on a card, and you program this little mouse by putting. Let's say you want the mouse to move from here to get the cheese. So you program your mouse. I want him to go forward once, twice, three times. Then I want him to turn right. And then I want him to turn, uh, go forward. 
and then you put him down and you say go and he you'll see if you programmed him right to get the cheese simple 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 five and up we we played with this so much we had to buy a second one yeah. <laughs> uh, this is the coda pillar very similar very similar uh, each piece has a direction and it links together like a, the links of a caterpillar each one has a USB and you click, click them together and then when you want them to go it just easily clicks together yeah. <laughs> yes a child can do it and uh, I think you have to turn it on maybe it is on there's a switch under his head switch under his head I don't want to switch all right here we go well, he makes an annoying sound oh I love it Peg loves it. Anyway, you can string all these directions together and it'll you hit start, it will do it. So let's put it on the ground. I know, I'm sorry about this. So he's gonna go, he's first he's gonna turn to the right. Because I programmed him to do that. That's what those things are, those are the codes. So each piece of Oh, that's a repeat. I would have put a repeat on it. You can do whatever you want. You're, you're All right, we'll stop this. Yeah, so yep, I can't take that. Yeah, it's really this is a good one to send far away. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you always give a gift that makes a lot of noise to someone you don't see very often. <laughs> Madison, I'm thinking Madison. The nice part is two hours away. Two hours away. They're bigger pieces, so you don't have to worry about kids swallowing them. So that's yeah. Preschoolers right. can code. Preschoolers can set it to make it do whatever you want. Yeah, um, I had. I was in the children's department and there was a little boy playing with this and I ha asked him how he worked and he showed me how it worked uh, and then I had to play with it. So, yeah. you know what, that's great. The Ozobots are really small and tiny. They understand um, marks on a page. Oh, cool. So, as a participant, you fill out the grid and you give it directions. And there's a code sheet so that if you want it to go fast, it's a blue, black, blue. If you want it to be uh, slow, it's a red, black, red. And you give it directions. Um, if it reaches, if it gets no direction and it gets to an intersection, it's random. And that's a great lesson to learn about what's random. It's going to make a decision that you didn't tell it, so it's going to make a decision on its own. Um, and so really, really fun. They're very, very tiny. This is real life technology too. Um, my husband and I went to a um, combine factory in Nebraska one time. And we went through this whole factory and I kept thinking, wow, this is pretty cool. But there was all these lines on the floor. And I asked, you know, me, because I can't stop asking questions. Uh, what, what are the lines on the floor? Well, if some station on the assembly line runs out of parts, they just send a message to the part room and a little cart follows that line oh, on the floor wow. to the place that needs the tools, who needs awesome. the parts. Yeah. This is awesome. Yeah. So, well, and you turn them on, you set them on the paper, and it follows the line. <laughs> You'll see it change color, now it turned. Now our green, black, green is something else, I don't know. faster. Yeah. So it follows, and you can be very creative. Oh, it's turbo fast. Something must have made it go really, really fast. <laughs> I think it's going to be in a pattern that's, well. So anyway, we'll let him run around. <laughs> Those are Ozobots. That's um, not they on your paper. What? Yeah, it is. It's, yeah, the What's on my paper? Oh, there it is. Yeah. Ozobots. Yeah. yeah. What um, group is that for? So? I've no, seen no, preschoolers no. play with that. All you have to do is draw a line. And you could put make it on the line. Oh, yeah. And then it will be tied yeah. whenever. Yeah. Most everything is available yeah. for mammals. Um, this is, uh, these are Osmo games. They do require a, an iPad, which, was, which makes this game very expensive. Um, but there are two uh, coding games that Osmo has created. There's a coding game and then there's a musical. So they can make music uh, using code. And we could demonstrate that later on. But you do have to have an iPad. Uh, that's not in a case. And then the technology is that a mirror fits over the camera and oh. makes the playing space in front of the iPad oh. interactive with the computer. Oh. 
So it's very awesome. We have other games, but I just brought the coding games today. I hope that doesn't go off. The, I don't think it will. No. <laughs> um, this is Dash. This is our most expensive toy. We'll, we'll just Sorry, put it down. Turn them on. That's okay. Um, he makes me think a little bit of uh, like Hal on 2001 A Space Odyssey. I can't do that, Hal, or whatever his name was. Okay, so we're connecting. Uh, he will turn to your voice. He's voice activated, so if I, if I start talking over here, and I'll say, yeah, I'm going to talk about Dash pretty soon, uh, Dash will turn and look at me. Or maybe he won't. <laughs> oh, you heard somebody laugh over there. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Dash. So what I want to do is I want to, I want to program him to knock down those, those um, bowling pins. And so I use a language called Blockly, which snaps directions one at a time under a start button. So when I hit start, then I want this to happen. I want him to go forward. Uh, well, actually, I want him to turn because right now he'll run into the wall. So I'm going to have him turn left, right? He's got to turn left. Is that correct? Yeah. To knock the bowling pins down. I can adjust how, what, do I want it 90 degrees? Do I want it 45 degrees? This is a great math learning game, great strategy. Um, then I want him to go forward, and he goes by centimeters. Oh, there's something we don't talk about very much anymore. Remember when we were going to go all go yeah. metric? Oh, that, that didn't happen very much. So I'm just going to make him go 100. I, I know it's not going to be enough. And I'm just going to hit start so you can see what happens. So I had him turn and go forward. Oh, almost. almost. So later on, if you want to play and knock down the pins. Um, we have four, so teams can play against each other. It's very, very fun. Uh, Molly went to a workshop. Explain the, po the storm poopers. Well, it, you can either use them to make like an obstacle course and drive him around them, or we found you could stack them on top of the solo cups and knock them over if you wanted to. Use them as another target. So, Star Wars is hot. We might as well jump on that bandwagon and play with storm poopers instead of storm troopers. <laughs> uh, these, are, these are the board games that require no technology whatsoever. There's uh, Robot Turtles on the end, and this one is Code Monkey Island. This is for 10 and up. It's a little bit more advanced. That one's for 5 and up or 4 and up. I can't remember. Yeah. Um, but it's that basic computational thinking. I don't need to make a set of directions for my, my, put, my piece to move. You, and you can play without any technology at all. Okay. Terrific. This is our 3D printer. You move them. Oh, it's the old-fashioned board game, you know. So you make directions, though. Uh, you, you, your card gives you directions. Oh, okay. Oh, so you're. Yeah. You're not so, really creating in that. Well, you're you're strategizing and making. You're playing against someone, so you are strategizing. I'd have to play it again. It's been a long time. 3D printer. Uh, we have uh, uh, ten. Uh, Chromebooks. Chromebooks are awesome because they are mini little tablets with with keyboards, so it's not touch screen. Um, and we can we have these set up to play with code.org, and you can learn to code. But if you want to come back that first weekend in uh, December, Patsy's got a Tuesday night up in the conference room where people can play with code. Um, I've got Wednesday night, I think, and Emily's got Thursday night. I don't know. It'll be on our on our website, but. We use these to go our code. So that was exciting. I'm very excited to Thank introduce you. this to you. And if you have questions, check out some of our books. There's a magazine listed there. If you give a magazine subscription to somebody, that's a great magazine. So thank you very much. There's business cards over there, too.